Welcome to the Armory Show and to Armory Live. It's my pleasure to introduce our very last talk of the fair, um, a conversation between Peter Campus and Dr. Tina Rivers Ryan. One of the first generation of video artists, Peter Campus has pioneered ways of using video technologies to explore topics ranging from human psychology to the natural landscape. In conjunction with the presentation of his work at the Armory Show and his first museum survey in the United States, Video Ergo Sum, at the Bronx Museum, Campus will be in dialogue with Dr. Tina Rivers Ryan, assistant curator at the Albright Knox Art Gallery, about his single channel videos and video installations dating back to the 1970s. There'll be a short period at the end for some questions, but in the meantime, please join me in welcoming Tina and Peter. Is this microphone? Yes, the microphone is on, fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for being here today for this conversation. I'm incredibly lucky to be able to talk to Peter Campus today for all of you, in front of all of you. Uh, thank you to the Armory Show for the invitation, uh, to both of us for being here. Um, I didn't ask you if you wanted any kind of formal introduction. Your resume, I think if we tried to go through, would, would take us the entire hour, so. Let's do, let's do it, okay. He says, let's do it. Um, uh, Peter Campus really needs no introduction, one of the pioneers of video art going back to the 1970s, um, also a, uh, a pioneering uh, teacher who has been teaching for very many decades, um, so his work uh, you know, has been part of the art historical canon for a long time. Um, I, uh, I mean, I should say really quickly, obviously his work is also in the collection of pretty much every major institution around the world, including many here in New York. If you want the full rundown, that's why they invented the internet, um, so go, go forth and prosper. Um, the occasion for us having this conversation today is a show at the Bronx Museum. And so if you have not yet been, that's okay because it just opened on a... That's not me. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone is saying that's me. I just want you all to know that's not me. Is your microphone on? Can, can everyone hear him? Yes, it's on. Okay, fantastic. It's not me. It's not him. It's some other... We, we're trying to figure out who it is, David Ross and I, but we can't. But I know it's not me. So um, that's not Peter Campus, but that is his work, Optical Sockets, and yes. this is the press release for his show at the Bronx Museum. Um, it originated at the Jeux de Palme, uh, and so we're very, very lucky to have it here now in the United States. It's the first major survey um, of Peter's work, um, and it is open, as you can see, through July 22nd. And I just want to stress, uh, as you'll see throughout this presentation, that Peter's work is not only in single-channel video, but also uh, closed circuit video, video installation. Um, he's worked basically in every mode of video art, including digital processing. So it's, it's really important to see his works in person, as is always the case with, um, with art and with video art, but particularly the video installations. This is an incredibly rare opportunity to be able to see those works and experience them in a way that you, know, you just can't otherwise. You're just watching documentation. Um, what I'm gonna do today is move us chronologically through Peter's career. Um, we're going to move very quickly through the beginning of his career, so we have a little bit more time at the end to talk about his more recent works. Um, like all artists, I think you know Peter's more interested in what he's doing now um, than what he's done before. Um, so we're, we'll focus on that. And then, um, as was mentioned, we'll open it up to questions from the audience at the end. So Peter explicitly told me that he would hate um, he would hate for me to show this video, so I'm showing it. This is three transitions from 1973, and I'm showing it because um, I'm a curator, but also an art historian, and I have to do my due diligence as a former art history professor and make sure that we all have seen this video. Um, it is incredibly important. I'm sure most of in the, you in the room have seen it. That's probably why you're here for this conversation. Um, this is uh, a single channel video that Peter made at uh, the Experimental Television Studio at WGBH in Boston, which was um, one of the first institutions that welcomed artists to use their um, relatively sophisticated video synthesizers and editing tools to make video art. Um, 
th these early works um, are often, as in, is in the case with a, a lot of early video art, they're, they're performances for a static camera. Um, but then there's a lot of video processing that comes into them, as you can see here, um, using chroma key technology. I'm oh, sorry? Two cameras. Two cameras, two sorry, cameras. using two cameras. Um, um, but the, the cameras are static, um, but there is video processing here. So one way that these works can be talked about is as an exploration of the possibilities of the medium of video. Um, there's something um, that's happening here that's very intrinsic to video that would be very hard to do in the medium of film. And Peter has said that he was attracted to working with video precisely because of what it offered that film didn't. Um, but the other major thing going on here is an exploration of psychology. Um, and as is well known, he has a background in psychology. And so these are not only about video as a medium, but also using video to explore, for example, the nature of perception or the relationship between the interior world and the exterior world. Um, so Peter has said a lot about these early videos over the years. Um, you know, these works are almost half a century old now. Um, but I did want to ask him one question, which was about the role of the institution in the development of video art. Um, because I think now we live in a world where everyone has access to a video camera, and in fact, everyone is carrying a video camera with them at all times on our cell phones. And so I wanted to go back to this earlier historical moment um, when video was not quite as ubiquitous and talk about the role of WGBH in the creation of these early video projects and then how that might you know, be different from how you're working today. Um, some of my past history comes to play here. Um, I, when I graduated uh, school, then I went into the Army. When I got out of the Army, I went into film school, and then I worked in the film business. So working in the film business, I got very used to working in studios. Um, otherwise, working with WGBH would have been rather difficult. It's a very... Um, dull place in terms of sound. You can hear nothing uh, outside. And it's big cavernous space, and there's film crew around. And they can be very annoying also. So I had to be kind of used to that situation. And I had no problem. Um, and the, particularly the people in the control room uh, were saying, what is that guy doing? And you know, oh my God! And who? Why are we doing this? And that kind of thing. It was rather discouraging. But I knew exactly what I wanted to do, and I did most of it in one day, and then begged them to let me come back for a second day to do the third part. Uh, and I thought the reason it's called three transitions. I thought they wanted to broadcast it. And so my idea was to broadcast one, each transition between two shows. So there'd be Masterpiece Theater and Julia Childs and one of my videos would be in between. But when we had all finished, they told me that we couldn't do that <laughs> or they couldn't do it. And so we left with these three transitions. So I never knew that that was the origin of the, the three transitions, that the transitions are not just referring to what's happening in the videos well, themselves, but that they were situated, or they were supposed to be situated sort of interstitially between regular programming. I, I was hoping one day to see it that way, someday. Mm -hmm. But um, that's doubtful. But yes, it, it had two meanings. Everything I do has at least two meanings. Two meanings. Well, great. I'm glad we've only got an hour to uh, unpack <laughs> your whole career here. I just want to say to the audience, in front of us is a red sign here that is right now at 42.02. It's counting down the time we have. So if you want to feel relaxed about time and just sitting here and enjoying the situation, there's 41.52 now. <laughs> well, we'll get back to the question of temporality <laughs> later. That's yes. coming. I guess I should have waited for that one. Um, this is another one of the early videos um, that Peter made, Head of a Sad Young Woman. Um, and just to point out, you know, that, that again, with his early videos, they're about the medium of video, but they're also very much about psychology, about experience, about perception, about the projection of emotion. Um, so we'll move on from that. Here's a short clip. And, Obviously, from an art historian's perspective, there's a certain relationship here to Andy Warhol's screen tests. Um, 
but as opposed to the affectless um, behavior of the performers in the screen tests, you know, Peter made these works by asking um, the performers to, you know, actually project a kind of emotion. And there's an incredible intensity here, which is very much exploiting the properties of video um, that, that sort of made it special. Uh, in the very beginning when it emerged, it was thought to have a greater intimacy than film um, and, and immediacy as well. And so he's exploiting both of those properties. At the same time that he's making these um, single channel videos, he's also developing video installation art, um, particularly using closed circuit cameras. And I, I came across um, a quotation where Peter referred to CCTV as, quote, pure video. Um, and I love that idea that, um, you know, that the video camera itself is, is actually maybe in some sense more like a film camera um, than, than, than not, but that the closed circuit, the surveillance camera, truly is what video is all about in the sense that it's about that immediacy, about the live, um, the live feedback where you have this instantaneous transmission between the video recorder and the video monitor, um, which allows you to create these sort of loops. So Optical Sockets, um, which is on view at the Bronx Museum, is a work that has um, four surveillance cameras and four monitors on pedestals and then a video mixer that introduces a, a kind of a special effect where the different perspectives of the cameras are overlaid. Um, and so you enter into this matrix of surveillance and experience yourself you know, from different sides. And it's incredibly disorienting, um, but uh, you know, incredibly poetic at the same time. And of course, now with surveillance and surveillance cameras, we think about that as a political problem and a social problem, the problem of surveillance. But Peter's work, I think especially um, you know, back in the day, was also really about the psychology of surveillance and the way in which our subjectivities are constituted in the process of, of you know, being watched, of feeling the gaze, of returning the gaze. Basically, it's about intersubjective, you know, interpersonal relationships. This is just a picture from Lisbon. Um, I mean, there are hundreds of things I could talk about at that point. But I think the main one, first of all, 38, 35. Just want you all to know, 38. Time 35. check. Um, the thing about video camera, I was used to looking through a film camera and also when you're done taking pictures you have to process it and if you're working on a project that could take a couple of days before you see what you actually have done. And um, video is immediate. And then the other part of immediate uh, video that interested me when you, when it first started out like in 1969 was the camera there was no place to look through it. Uh, how that finally evolved, the, the, there was a viewer that was attached to the camera then uh, fit on top of it. So it was a very awkward thing. And so I decided not to look through it and have the camera here and a place to look at the image over there, kind of what I call displacement. And so that's very obvious in this piece, Optical Sockets, where the, this camera image is displaced over here. And then all four cameras are bound together and displaced on four different. So that is impossible to do with film. Uh, maybe it's possible, but it'd be very difficult. And it wouldn't be immediate in time. And then the other really important thing is the the depiction of time in video is extremely different. And when you're interviewing someone, they perceive it as very different. So it's easier to have a really kind of smooth interview in video, whereas in film, people can get a little jumpy. I mean, they can hear the camera going click, 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 and, and also the cameraman say, okay, okay, it's 12 minutes, we have to stop. You know, let's bring in another reel or something. So it is, we could go with an interview for an hour without being interrupted. And then I began to think it's a totally understanding and totally different depiction of time. And when I was talking about it, I started replacing the word time with duration. 
So these, why I'm interested in these printed numbers here is because that's definitely time to me. It's counting one, two, three, four, up like that. Whereas duration is just the two of us sitting here, you sitting there, and there's no, there's no measurement quality to it. It's just letting things flow, and it's much more nature, and it's much more about nature. I mean, flow is a great word. I mean, that, that was another thing that was seized upon when people first started trying to theorize video, is that video is a flow of continuous information, as opposed to the discreteness of the celluloid, which has one film frame after another. That, you know, video is a continuous flow, both in the re act of recording and also in the act of transmission. You think about broadcast TV, just that flow of information, the flow of, you know, electrons, scan lines on a cathode ray monitor, right? So yeah, so duration, but you know, just um, you know, to underscore the fact that so many of your works are about the experience, the phenomenology of, of perception and about time and experiencing time, um, which is true, I guess, of a lot of video art, um, but that you know, your works, um, especially the ones that are spatial in a way, connect more to our everyday lived experience of time rather than like the time of, of art, which I think is what you're trying to get at with just yes. that sense of flow. Those early works by Nauman, um, 68, 69, the Carter pieces, just totally changed that. Some of them were recordings, but the recordings were totally determined by the length of the reel, which sometimes could be an hour. And there was no thought of um, the kind of mechanical time. When I was editing, which I did for a living for a number of years, that's definitely in mechanical time. You're definitely chop, 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 and, and keep things moving and keep things interesting and you know engage people. And even now, as video is shifted over to film and totally used by the film business, uh, which we once called video, that's um, also chopped up time. It's not continuous at all. It's so strange because the medium is continuous. Right. So um, as is well known, you have this incredible period of experimentation in the 70s, pioneering multiple different formats of video art. And then you take a break. So from 1978 mm -hmm. to 1996, a period of 18 years, one of the foremost video artists doesn't make any video. Um, and that's sort of the narrative uh, that we have, is that he takes this break and he gets involved in photography. But um, I think what you know, is becoming increasingly clear is that there's actually a, a continuity of ideas and themes between uh, his early videos and, and the um, photographs that he was making in the 1980s. Um, he has now returned to video, so that's why it's sort of interregnum. I say he stopped you know, for 18 years, so he started up again in the 90s. But I, I do want to take a minute. I realize that this was billed as a conversation about video art, um, but I want to take a minute to talk about the photos, because the way that you approach photography, I think, is very much informed by your perspective as um, a, a video maker. So um, first of all, we should point out that the, the content of the works appears to change pretty dramatically. So he switches from video to photography, but also um, we see the emergence of his interest in nature and landscape, which is something that has stayed with him ever since. So what we're looking at here, for example, Murmur from 1987, um, this is a photo of a stone that obviously is redolent of a heart, and that is evoked by the title, Murmur. You think of the heart murmur. Um, so um, there is something, again, incredibly um, poetic about this image. We're dealing with associations. Um, so again, the, you know, psychology, thinking about projection, um, which is uh, uh, both of something very mm. literal in the sense that these images from the very beginning were actually not necessarily shown as photographic prints, but were projected, um, but also the act of projection, the way in which the viewer brings to the work their own associations and ideas. Very um, good. <laughs> thank you. I don't think anyone has noticed that before or not mentioned it, but yes, that's entirely accurate. Um, so um, the other thing that I, I know has been commented upon is the way in which you, um, on a sort of technical level, take photos that are something like um, something like videos and vice versa, that there is this interesting dialogue between stillness and the moving image. So um, for example, actually, I can show a photo 
as I mentioned, you know, these, these images are projected. So he's taking an image that is a still image, and he is, in a way, through the act of projection, projection turning it into a, a, a time-based image, a durational image, an image that continues to unfold over time and that moves in some way. Um, you know, maybe not literally in the sense that you don't see any change happening on the, on the projected surface, but the image is live in a way that a printed photograph is not. So I wanted um, to stop I, talking I, and, and have oh. you talk a little bit more about the relationship between your early video and these photos. I was just about to interrupt you. So. Um, but this is probably not exactly to the point, but in the past, when I first started doing these uh, still photos, uh, they were done with um, high contrast film and in, in a studio, and we did, uh, I made negatives, or no, I made uh, positives. And the problem was that the, the projectors that we used, or almost any projector, would burn through them or, or f at least fade them in two or three weeks no matter what kind of film we used. So when we came back to the Jeu de Pomme show, um, we were, and they're owned, a number of them are owned by this uh, museum in Germany in München Gladbach. And so th it was a problem. How are we going to show them without having that process happen? And also photography has been replaced by digital photography. So the whole thing was very difficult to figure out. So we decided, I decided, we, I don't know who I'm thinking, I decided to replace the um, still projectors with video projectors, high quality video projectors. And I made digital still files and the things just sat there and they were so flat that they looked terrible. So I replaced the whole thing with, by making videos, just leaving the, from still, high contrast still photographs. And they moved. <laughs> so all of a sudden, what we used to have was a still photograph, now was a made, switched to video, and it was just moving slightly like that, which was incredible. And I felt, this is another topic you want to talk about, but I felt by changing from photography to video, we gave it a new kind of life, and I found it much more interesting. I'm sure in some art historical way we're insulting somebody, but I thought it was a big improvement. That's your prerogative, you're the artist. So. <laughs> yes, I am the artist, I outrank you, and, but yes. And I, I just realized, I you know, forget to mention, but needless to say, these are also photographs that engage um, the, the sort of episteme or the mode of, of video because they are shown at a scale Right, that is not a photographic scale, that is the scale of a moving image. It approaches the scale of cinema, for example. Um, and also they're shown in a black box. Um, you know, we talked a lot art historically about the, um, the invention of the black box inside the art museum in the 1990s, as a, you know, the black box as opposed to the white cube. Um, but here, you know, you're also, you know, you're doing that already. Um, all right, shall we move on? Sure. More soon? Okay. So, um, as a curator who's very interested in digital technologies and media, oh, oh, I'm gonna, well, I guess I should really quickly say something about that. I was gonna pass over it. Um, so my home institution is the Albright Knox, and we do have Peter in our collection. Um, and this is just to um, sort of emphasize the point that we've you know, been making, um, that he uses photography like video and vice versa. So we have these nine um, Polaroids, and obviously, you know, Polaroids, they're static photographs. But because of the sequential, you know, arrangement of them, there's something um, inherently, you know, I don't want to quite say filmic, but moving image-like about these. They imply a duration, a progression through time. So, um, all right, so here we go, computer drawings. So, um, I hope this is gonna blow some people's minds, if not in this room, then when this gets to the internet. Um, but, uh, you know, Peter was one of the first artists to adopt uh, computer technologies and to make computer drawings. So everyone now, you know, is very much enamored with David Hockney's iPad drawings, for example. But Peter was, you know, working on the computer to make digital drawings, you know, 25 years ago. Sorry, uh, 20, 
art historian, I don't do numbers or math. Um, it was a while ago. Um, so he's doing these many, computer many drawings. Many, many years ago. Many, many years ago. We don't like quantifying things, right? We've already established I, I that. I don't very much, but this yeah. was before styluses, so I was actually making these, most of them, with, with mice, with, mouse, with a mouse. Yeah. So they were really strange, and they were such low quality. I mean, it's amazing. So, so I want to ask you, you, know, you mentioned that they're low quality. So why, I mean, I'm just curious, what attracted you to working with these technologies? And compared to the analog technologies that you had worked with up until that time, what were the like advantages? And, drawing. <laughs> and Yeah, and, and, and what were the advantages and what were the limitations? I don't know what the advantages were. It's, it's like everything else, um, for me, it's an interface and I like to kind of challenge the interface. So part of the interface was working with a very low powered computer and part of it was trying to see what I could do that would look like it was so much more. But um, on the other way, supposing I tried to make this very thing with a number two pencil or something or chalk or whatever, um, that, that would not look as good to me as this does because this shows the pixels, this shows the, that I'm working with another technology, trying to, trying to tame it, trying to make it into something. Now it's less interesting to me because with a stylus and a pad you can do anything. I mean, iPad, I don't know, whatever number, iPad 5 with pencil, <laughs> you know, it's wonderful. You can do whatever you want. But this was so much more primitive, and that was very exciting to me. So um, it's not as apparent here, but perhaps in your um, digital collages, it's quite clear that you know one of the major subjects of your digital works is is nature, is is landscape. And again, this is a theme that has preoccupied you, you know, pretty much ever since. And I think that. On the surface, it might seem paradoxical that you are an artist who is using um, technologies, and particularly, you know, what at the time were cutting-edge technologies to explore our relationship to nature. But um, I would love you to talk a little bit more about why you felt it was appropriate, or, or what the advantages are of using digital technologies to talk about nature. The first time I heard that question, I got really angry, so didn't have any kind of response to it. But I have had to think it through because people have asked me over and over. My most defensive response, of course, is that, you know, wouldn't paint on canvas be as far from nature as this is, you know, or paint on oils or, or paint on acrylics. Oh my God, paint on, how can you use an acrylic to paint nature, you know? And that must have been said, you'll have to tell me what year, but, you know, that kind of thing. So it's just, but I suppose it is really different. Um, you know, we can connect everything using pixels and atoms and making that connection. And I think given that we're looking at microcosms and looking down to the atomic level and, uh, and trying to talk about quantum theory, artists are so caught up in quantum theory mostly because we have no idea what it is. But, um, but it is just going down to basics of things and looking at what makes them up. And so with, you know, since the computer image is based on a whole bunch of pixels lined up in a row, you know, both vertical and horizontal, you know, that, that's the thing at, at its basis. So I think there's a lot of good reason for doing it in that way. But I, I don't know that I ever conquered it, frankly. I, very soon after these images, I gave up and went back to video. It, I seemed to be missing something. And I think what I was missing was the aspect of, of uh, duration. That you might think that a photograph has, is in that axis, but I don't, it isn't. Um, I think paintings and photographs are very effective because you spend some time traveling through them. Like in 
uh, Chinese painting of the 11th century, you find yourself on an actual path where you're going along the path and going from one end of the painting to another. And I, I just couldn't ever um, beat that. I, I was always dealing with sequential images. And I remember when someone wrote about that in Art in America, I think, no, uh, Art Forum, they were calling attention to that. And it helped me understand that that is what I was doing. Like, you know, that all of these things were images that were removed in my mind from, or cut away in my mind from a continuum. So I was able to quickly get back after that. So um, speaking of your return to video, so the, the exhibition title of your show that it's at the Bronx is a is video ergo sum like I video therefore I am, and I but it's a joke because what does video mean? <laughs> it means to see and right. Right. So therefore, it's to an see, update of to Cartier, see, Cartesian. To see therefore yeah. I am, to which is not true, but that's what it was referring to. So um, I think the the way that the exhibition explains the title is that, you know, video has always been present in your practice. And so as an artist, your identity is, is tied up with video. Um, so I, I video, therefore I'm, I'm an artist or make art or something along those lines. Um, so I, I do, I can go ahead and play a little clip of Video Ergo Sum Island. So there are, are multiple videos with that, um, with that title, Video Ergo Sum. Um, there was a series of eight, and this was around 2000. Um, and um, I decided when we did the Jeu de Pomme show that just to take it, right? Is that right? Where, we have Anne Marie, the curator of the where exhibition. Where the title here. Video Ergo Sum came from? Yeah, it came from these videos. So, um, you know, as you can see just in this brief clip, you're using a similar kind of collage aesthetic that you were using in your digital photographs right before this. You have, you know, um, different image streams that are sort of merging together here. Um, and speaking of streams, water, I think, is one of the major preoccupations. Um, so, um, you know, Peter moved out to Long Island. Um, a long time ago, that's been his home base, and he's very close to the beach and the water. Um, as a native Floridian, I really can respond um, to your love for the water um, that's in your works. And water is such a perfect um, metaphor in a way for, um, for you to use for a couple reasons. One is, is that video itself has been compared to water. Again, the notion of video as being about a continuous flow of information, a continuous flow of energy. Um, so, you know, water is a metaphor for video. Um, water also gets us to a lot of the metaphorical language about the self um, and uh, consciousness. Um, as you've talked about, um, you know, thinking about consciousness as like that wave that um, emerges out of the dark sea that is the unconscious, for example. Um, and um, it also gets us to, um, to the history of art and the history of painting um, and painterly, um, there's something very painterly about the way that water appears in, in Peter's work. And um, as an art historian, I'm very interested in the relationship between video art and art history that is much broader than just the history of video and the history of art and technology. Also, my father was a doctor and um, really talked about, he, th he thought the human body was amazing. I mean, he thought it was miraculous. And as someone who had dissected a lot of human bodies, which is really awful to me, mm -hmm. but he's, we're made up, he said, of 97% water, um, which is really pretty amazing when you think about that, and that in relationship to larger bodies of water, and that in us in relationship to our planet, and all kinds of um, things like that. Mm -hmm. So it, it, I, I think better visually than I do with words, so a lot of what I'm doing is translating. <laughs> Well, you're doing a great job. <laughs> um, so we have more water images. So now we're getting into the, the sort of most recent period of your videos where you're using 
high definition digital cameras and yet you're processing them um, in a way that I think very um, cheekily, you know, takes this high def material and makes it low def. You're removing information in a way um, by, um, as you can see here, um, processing the video to transform the image into the series of, I mean, pixelated is, I mean, not technically what's happening, but it, it produces a kind of pixelated image. And, you know, we're reminded of, um, of a mode of abstraction that is about uh, abstraction as a, as a transitive verb, as abstracting from the world and distilling down and removing information. Um, so that's what's going on here in Red Fence, for example. Um, we see, um, you know, some uh, red plastic fencing, and you can tell that there is movement in the image, but also the amount of movement has been slowed down um, and reduced. So again, thinking about the relationship between photography and video, this is video being brought closer to the status of photography in the sense that it's being slowed down. And um, did you want to say more? Were you about to jump in? Yeah, um, just about the nature of abstraction. First of all, the, the the word as I first came across it was an abstract of a scientific paper would be presented at the head of the paper and it would be basically a condensation of what the meaning of the paper was. And I, I think perhaps people have lost sight of, of the meaning of the word abstraction that is really relating to uh, the reality that's out there. And I guess that's why people start talking about non-objective art and things like that, that were clearly not abstractions. But I'm, in my abstract work, I'm always thinking of abstraction. In my non-abstract work, um, I'm thinking back to abstractions. I must have missaid something in there, but abstract work was going back to reality and reality is going back to abstraction. So if you see, when I'm doing a realistic work, I'm thinking of how the space is abstracted in that work. And I mean, and you know, there's a lot of art historical precedents for what you're doing here, but thinking about um, the relationship to, to spatial depth and volume, for example, where just like, um, you know, basically analytical cubism, you're kind of sucking the depth out of the picture plane and, you know, getting to something that's more grid-like. So I actually picked the red fence video in particular to show because the red fence becomes not just a physical object in space that reminds us of, you know, a seaside location that has netting on it, but um, it becomes a, a modernist grid, basically. This important point here that I'm not reconstructing in my work, and I, I, th I think that is why the abstract and non-abstract work gets joined together, because I'm not moving the parts around. I'm not deconstructing them and reconstructing them but they're as is. And yeah. basically, the way I'm working on them to make them abstract like red fence is done by just working on them, working on them without changing anything in the picture, mm -hmm. including color. No, I changed the color. I was going to say, those, those <laughs> colors look a little keyed up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Okay, I'm glad we got to that point. You got me on that one. Um, so, you know, I was already gesturing towards, um, towards a much larger history of art. So, I mean, we were just talking about 20th century modernism, but, you know, um, the, the landscape, um, especially seascapes, I mean, this is one of the classic genres of Western painting. And um, this work, A Wave, and I'll now put it in motion for you, um, you've talked about how it was very specifically inspired by your encounter at a very young age with a painting by Milton Avery um, that also featured a kind of abstracted wave. Um, and so that was where you use the language to talk about a wave being a kind of metaphor for the emergence of consciousness out of the void that is the dark sea. A tangential point is we always had art in our house and as well as we knew museums very well, so we were taken to museums. Um, and, and so that was the era of, of, of work that was in my house, more or less, like 20s, 30s, and 40s. Mm -hmm. And all, I always want to point out how important it was for me to have art in my house. Part of the work I do is to make work for people's houses. Uh, I want people to experience work of any kind, anything they want to bring home, 
you know, and have to live with because it's a very different experience than working, th walking through, let's say, Times Square and seeing something for two minutes and 50 mm -hmm. seconds. So, I mean, you know, we think of like, you know, the impressionist seascape as being one of those, you know, obviously at the time very radical, but now as being one of those sort of stereotypical images that you might find a reproduction of in someone's home. Oh, yeah. um, so, or Van Gogh flowers or... Right, exactly. Uh, the, um, and of course, impressionism here is an important term for thinking through what you're doing with your relationship to nature. Um, but there's something I've been saying, I'm sorry to go off point again, but yeah. there's this idea that art has no continuity and that art, like politics, seems to be one generation re re rejects what the last generation was doing and you just careen about. And I'm much more in favor of a kind of con continuum mm -hmm. through art. I, there's something I'd like to see so there's just slight movements to one way or slight movements to another. There's not a feeling that everything has to be avant-garde, you know, not let it just continue through the, the main stem of, of the movement. And well, the Obama's talked about sweep and things like that. And I think there's something like that in art too mm -hmm. um, that you can find. I mean, it definitely emerges in your work. I think that's one of the reasons I respond so positively is that you're clearly entering into a dialogue, a conversation with a much longer history of art that comes before. And you know, I think one of the issues we're dealing with now for those of us who deal a lot with art and technology is the conversation can be very presentist. Um, and not only is there an ignorance about the past, but there's a sort of um, uh, a kind of willful dismissal that really you know, what this work is about is about imagining the future. Um, but I, I, I suspect that artists are feel that curators are looking for something new and if it's digital looking for something that looks really digital and um, I think throughout my career I, I wanted not to do something new with something new I, if I worked in video a totally new thing I wanted it to look like painting or I wanted it to look like it could have been done <laughs> I don't know there's, there must be some truth in that sentence somewhere. But. Well, I was gonna say, it doesn't totally look, you know, because yeah. obviously, you know, we're, we're animated here, but there is clearly a conversation that's happening. But I love that idea of wanting to do something, you know, with new materials that doesn't necessarily look so radically new. Yes, and I think most artists I talk to all through computer, I mean, through all the, the things that have happened in the past 50 years, felt that they had to do something so new you know, that it would surprise. And I think a lot of people at first when I worked in video thought that I was doing that, but I didn't think I was doing that. And then decades later when artists talked to me, they said, well, they thought that I helped them see what was the possibility of video mm -hmm. by not doing that. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out if I want to talk about the art market and its, its demands and the way that it shapes <laughs> how <laughs> mediums are used, considering that we're sitting on stage at the armory, but um, I'm gonna behave, so we're not gonna talk about it. Oh. <laughs> we can talk about it in the Q&A. Um, so uh, I guess the, the last thing I wanted to talk about, um, and, then, and then yeah, we'll open it up to questions from the audience. I'm hoping that you guys have some at this point, and if you haven't already, um, come in with some. Uh, you know, one thing that we're really grappling with now, we meaning these institutions, um, and I guess private collectors as well, who have um, acquired works of time-based media art, one thing that we're really grappling with is how we're going to conserve these works and present them in the future as the technologies on which they depend inevitably obsolesce, um, you know, or just evolve. So um, we earlier saw this image, uh, you know, this video, Head of a Woman. Um, and right now, uh, for the rest of the month of March, uh, this work is on view in Times Square as part of the Midnight Moment series. And if you're not familiar with this initiative, it's incredible. Um, they pick a, a different video artist every month, and every night in Times Square at midnight, video art will play for five minutes or whatever it is. Three or two minutes, and eight, uh, two minutes, 
50 seconds. I thought we didn't like to quantify. That's right. Duration, they right? Do. Time is supposed they, to be, they, they, they do. They do. Um, <laughs> so. Um, I'm standing there with duration and the duration ends abruptly. And the, it ends very abruptly. <laughs> so um, actually, 50 seconds I do have a little video here of you encountering this piece in Times Square. So, um, so they, you know, they bring video art to, um, you know, the, the heart of American middle brow culture. And um, I love that this was the video in particular that was selected to be exhibited because um, maybe I'm just uh, projecting here, but I think there's probably no sadder place than Times Square. <laughs> so head of a sad young woman um, feels very appropriate. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I'm really interested by how this video has evolved to occupy this space because I know that you've said in the past um, in regards to certain works of yours that you're actually very deliberate about the materials you use. You know, you've talked about how even the brackets that are used to mount the cameras are specific and, you know, cannot be substituted. Uh, so, um, and also another example of this, if you go to the Bronx Museum and you see some of the early videos from the 1970s, they're exhibited on those old square CRT monitors. So you really get a sense of the historicity of the videos. It's like a little bit of a time capsule. Um, and obviously there's an, an aesthetic reason for that. And there's also um, a technological argument to be made because funny things happen when you take videos of that era and then digitize them and then put them on screens that have higher luminosity or higher resolution or just a different um, format going from you know a square format to a widescreen format, for example. Um, and yet here with this video, it's been completely reimagined, blown up on giant screens, you know, exhibited in sort of like multiple, um, turned into kind of an um, environmental installation. So um, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more about your thoughts about how your videos will continue to evolve um, over time in, in, or how they may not and how you're negotiating that. I, I have multiple strands here. So one strand is, mostly I'm not nostalgic about this kind of thing. And the reason we're using old equipment is because a lot of these particular pieces have to do with uh, sculpture and volume and, and they don't translate from three dimensions to what's essentially two dimensional screens. Because the screens and, and the monitors are important, they're part of the piece. So. Um, when I've looked at it with newer technology, uh, for these particular pieces, it hasn't looked right to me, mostly because they lost the volume. And I think they look better in black and white than they do in culture. Color, color is distracting. But remember, I was brought up in film, so you know I like higher quality. In video, they're just about getting now in 4K down to what 35 millimeter film looks like. And you know, I want it. I love it. <laughs> I love the that quality. I've missed it from you know not working in film. So yes, two minutes and fifty six seconds. <laughs> I wasn't checking. I wasn't checking the time. My mom is calling me, so oh, I just muted it. <laughs> could we, maybe we could talk to her for a while. <laughs> um, but I I really like the trend to much more detailed imagery and video now. Um, and, uh, you know, that's why I, I was the first on my block to run out and get a 4K camera, you know, because I just like the quality. I don't, it takes a while to figure out what to do with it, but I like it. I like working with that. So I miss it. And that's why I'm going in that direction. I don't think, like, people like Bill, Viola, and the Wilson twins, moved to 16 millimeter um, to get the better quality, or in Bill's case, to get things slowed down properly. But um, I don't, I am a video person. I don't believe that I could do that. It seems like a betrayal to me. I, I mean, I know that's silly, but that's the way it seems. I want to keep working in video. I mean, uh, I also love, though, that the, the sight of video keeps evolving in your work. I mean, you know, you were showing video in the context of, you know, the, 
the established art museum, like, you know, the Whitney in 1973. I mean, your work has always existed within the discursive institutional physical space of the art museum. And yet, you know, here it is, you know, erupting into Times Square um, and, you know, to bring it full circle with three transitions, that that was something that was supposed yeah. to erupt into broadcast TV um, and interrupt, or what's the word we use now? Um, disrupt, it was supposed to disrupt, um, uh, you know, mainstream broadcast culture. So there's a very long-winded story here about Times Square. I hope I get to say it. But when Kristen asked me, and I don't know how long ago it was, but Kathleen thinks maybe a year or two, where she asked me, would I do it? I said, no, I hate the idea. I, and I have. I hated the idea all along. It was really her deal. She picked out the image, which was perfect. And I didn't like it really until I saw it, and then it knocked me off my feet. I mean, it was, it's incredible. I just love it. But it's, that's Kristen's work. <laughs> I mean, her working on me. She knows me long enough now to know if I say no, I don't really mean no. You know? <laughs> I mean maybe or something. Well, that's, that's a nice sort of positive note to end on. You're getting knocked off um, your feet by your own work. Um, and we have 11 <laughs> seconds left. So I'm going to watch the clock run out. And then um, this is the timer on our conversation. And then this means that now we have time for questions from the audience. So here we go. Or shouldn't you call your mother? Or <laughs> so, Julia, are we circulating a microphone? Yeah. I've, you I'll can have you. this one. No. Does anyone? <laughs> this is... I can, I can bring a mic to anyone who has a question. I'll ask a question. What, what, do you, what do you see as the future of video art? Now that AI is doing paintings and such. I'm 81 years old, and you think I'm thinking about the future. Well, <laughs> for the rest of us. As the, thing, the future I'm thinking about is not one you want to think about. But, um, you know, if I can jump in maybe um, and answer your question, I, I actually was thinking about machine vision earlier when um, Peter was talking about the surveillance camera and how the surveillance camera was disembodied from the monitor. So he was already in those early installations with the surveillance camera dealing with a kind of machine vision that was disembodied from human vision. Um, and it seems like that might be an important precursor to, to, to pair with, to think through some of these you know, more recent conversations about machine vision and AI-generated images and the like. Yeah. Well, Kathleen's really interested in that, so I talk about that because she's interested. <laughs> this is the first time I saw the red fence. I loved it. Um, but I'm wondering, is the red fence getting less abstracted, or is my mind putting it together? Less. I'm trying to hit a point where those two things are just vibrating against each other. Thank you. But, I mean, I've said this before, but what I'm looking for is the space in between abstraction and, and realism. And there's something about, you know, those works where, um, like the way they've been discussed is that because they're so low information, relative to like, you know, 4K, high def that you haven't fussed with, um, that the, the viewer is, feels, you know, called upon to sort of complete the picture or imagine it, um, you know, to sort of fill in the information and thereby becomes aware of their own process of perception. So that you paying attention to, you know, is it becoming more abstract or is it me, is my perception changing, that that's sort of, you know, built into the work. Well, in a way, what could be more abstract than 4K? I mean, it's so detailed, we can't mm. possibly look that way. We don't see that way. We're generally reducing the information that comes through our eyes to our brain. So this is just, I mean, I haven't figured it out yet. I mean, but there's something there that's really interesting. I think you just launched like, you know, five MFA careers right now by <laughs> saying that. What could be more abstract than 4K? It's gonna take a couple people their whole lives to work out. <laughs> I don't think we've seen This is my friend of 45 years. <laughs> who Therefore, sh who, I'm... Who was head of the kitchen in Soho in 1970, 
1973 or something. And That's right. Showed my work in 1974 or five. That's also right. Um, I don't think we saw any pictures of um, uh, people upside down or you know the things where people were spinning, so to speak. Um, how come? We can't find upside down people anymore. Really? <laughs> yeah. In, in 2019, it feels like the whole world is upside down, actually. No, that's true. That's all we see is upside down people now. I was thinking of, um, in our eyes, we see everything upside down. And there's absolutely nothing in the brain that makes them right side up. So it seemed to be an interesting idea to me. There was a famous psychology experiment where someone, someone wore glasses that turned everything upside down. And within a week, he could ride a bicycle, which is amazing. So this is just something. It doesn't happen in our brain. It's something that we do. We imagine to see everything upside down from what our eyes bring to us. So it interested me. So I made a bunch of pieces where every, for two years, wouldn't you say, I think. The Whitney owns one. <laughs> Actually, there's some big museums that own that upside down pieces. There was someone over there, I'd say. I'm a quiet, persistent person, so. Hi, I have a question about the uh, computer drawings. Uh, I wanted to know a little bit more about those and how you were exposed to um, getting access to a computer, if you bought it yourself, and then also somewhat related to what you just said about the 4K, uh, the commentary about it being more abstract, which is really fascinating. Uh, in relation to what you said about the computer drawings, um, you were saying that you wanted to work with this because it had pixels and because it was not pristine, whereas 4K is something that's hyper pristine. And I was just wondering if you could talk about that relationship a little bit more um, and where you find those to be divergent or maybe overlapping. Um, all I have time for is quips, so I don't know what more I can say with quip length. It's kind of a verbal tweet, but um, that's a big question. The, the, the drawing sent me into trying to express things in a basic way that I suppose is like subconscious that they was trying to present some subconscious images. I don't know. Maybe I'll remember, um, think about that some more. David? Oh, but could you, before we move on really quickly, could you answer the first part of the question? Do you, how you got access to the computer? Oh, yeah. Um, I bought one. <laughs> and uh, it was Macintosh. And it was a time that nobody in New York was selling Macintosh. And it, the, which was very strange. I mean, you have to remember Macintosh had like 1% of, of the market and probably that 1% were mostly artists. And so there was one place called Mac Emporium on 23rd Street and Madison Avenue. And it was not like a store. It was like some place where you'd go in and they'd show you everything and take apart the computer and really take it apart and say, oh, this is memory here and this is a drive here and blah, 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 blah. And um, of course, some chain bought them, and that was the end of that. Uh, but, and then years later, not so many years, I tried to show my students. I would take, bring in a computer and take it apart and say, no, you see this over here? This is, this is where memory is. And, and no one was interested. It so shocked me. Is that your generation? I mean, they just want to see a sealed box or something and say, this is a box. And this comes out of the box. And now Apple made it so that you can't open the damn thing because they'll take, take away your warranty, whatever that means. But yes. David. Um. Your work is. Is this the question you wanted to ask me in Paris two years ago? <laughs> can't remember. Um, work is uh, poetical 
and psychological, were you ever tempted to do something overtly political? Okay. Well, I wonder why you're asking that question now. Yeah. Is there anything going on in the world no, that's we were, prompting that? I don't know if you were, but my family was brought up communist. And was yours? Was, no, I don't think so, so much. Not like mine. David's my cousin. <laughs> but we were more than other, our relatives so much. And so I was just uh, overwhelmed with politics as a kid, as a child. And uh, I kind of, you know, got rid of it because it's so... Um, well, what we were brought up with was so not true, <laughs> you know, and got totally corrupted. So I've never been so interested in doing anything political. I'm interested, as you know, in, politi in politics. Um, but I like art to be on a different level than that. And when I see, um, I apologize to everyone in this room, but when I see art that's based on politics, I think of the propaganda that we were exposed to as children, or I was. And uh, I'm just not so interested. Well, if I can push back a little bit on that, though, I don't think that art that's about perception is apolitical. I think that you know, art that is about how we move in the world, how we experience the world, it has its own kind of politics. And then you know, you've also said explicitly that you're very interested in technology and how technology shapes our experience of the world. And certainly what we've learned in the past few years is that technology is extremely political. It's not apolitical at all, especially when it comes to you know, Facebook and social media and algorithms that control big data. So I, I, I don't see your work as being in, you know, apolitical. It's not propagandistic and it's not political on its face, but um, but you know, anything that's about how we exist in the world and especially about how technology impacts our lives, I think is inherently political in some way. But it's so much more, it's very complex, right? I mean, it's, I don't like all of it. I'm sure you don't either. I mean, that some of the, the directions we're going are kind of scary. Mm -hmm. So right. should I start finger painting? <laughs> it's like, I don't know quite how to incorporate that. But I think, you know, the answer is not necessarily to reject technology, but to yeah. figure out how to work with and through it, you know, given that it's, it's here to stay. So, unless, you know, we have like a nuclear holocaust and we all go back to the Stone Ages, so. We'll see. We don't need a nuclear holocaust as, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's overpopulation. I just looked around, we were at seven billion and now we're past seven and a half billion. I mean, that seemed to have happened just a few years ago. Yeah. <laughs> it's just outrageous. Hmm. So, Julia, should we wrap it up? If you'd like. I think that sounds good. If anybody has any further questions, you know, I'm sure I, the one great advantage of being the very last Armory Live event of the weekend is that we have this room, you know, for, for, for as long as they'll let us keep the lights on. So, and um, I just, I saw a couple of people recording the audio um, where it's being recorded and it will be available on our website. So if you would like a, a recording, that will be available. Okay, thanks. They're okay. doing it for me, but <laughs> you can have a copy as well. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you uh, very much, everyone, for coming. Thank you to Tina and to Pizza.